have a close dear friend uh, who is here today to preach the word of God. Her name is Halima Nash. She is an amazing, amazing um, um, just person, individual. We went to Duke Divinity School together. She, uh, myself, her, Pastor Donna, many of you uh, know of Pastor Donna, another friend, Precious, uh, who's actually preaching today in Los Angeles and may be coming up to preach up here pretty soon. Uh, we, we went through Duke and just burnt that thing to the ground. Amen. It's just never been the same. Somebody say amen. And she was a fire starter and I was the fire person. The fire, what, fireman, yeah, I was the one that tried to calm it down. Um, but Halima is, uh, got a bio, so I'm gonna read it so y'all can be impressed with her, uh, her journey um, and just see how qualified she is, certainly, just to speak to us, particularly on a day like today when we are excited about amplifying the voice of uh, our sisters. She is a consultant and chief partnerships officer of the Academy Group which is a startup that invests in young people from under-resourced communities and prepares them to own, operate, and incubate highly successful companies across sectors. As Chief Partnerships Officer, she manages external relations and corporate partnerships to ensure that all participating students have extraordinary academic and internship opportunities that propel them to successful careers. She has over 10 years of executive leadership experience, including the charitable engagement for the Chicago Bulls, the Chicago Housing Authority. She ran the youth um, uh, department at the Chicago Housing Authority. She led the Israel Ad Adonijay Foundation. She uh, worked at iMentor and consulting projects for Nike, the Chicago Blackhawks, Morgan Stanley, the city of Compton, and a few artists you may have heard of, Common and Kendrick Lamar. Somebody say amen. She is a proud Compton. So when, again, when I met Halima, she had just graduated from Howard University. Amen. Um, She's anointed. Okay. <laughs> I had to test you first. If you weren't an anointed bison, but you anointed. She, it's all right. She, she, they, they all have these, these beefs inside the historically black college university. Um, but she, she graduated. And when I met her, she was a hip hop artist at the time. She may like do a little rhyme. I don't know if you still, no, uh, her, her she was her name was Compton Virtue. Like she she rapped Compton so hard. I, I it was like you know it was like uh, N.W.A. and then Halima when I first met her. Uh, but she has uh, she has been a first generation college graduate. Listen, with a bachelor of business administration from Howard, a master of divinity uh, from uh, Duke, and a certificate in nonprofit management from Duke as well. Um, I just love Halima because uh, not many folks that we know make it out of some of these circumstances and she has stayed the same. Uh, everywhere she goes, she's repping for uh, those who are literally uh, living in some of the most challenging circumstances. And so I'm so glad that she's free. She was literally in New Orleans and on her way to Chicago and we are her pit stop, somebody say amen, on her way to um, her next assignment. She has a, a wonderful devotional called Endless Summer Devotionals. And uh, she, she was planning to bring dozens of them and she sold out most of them in her previous stop. So we have about eight books left but you can get her book at amazon.com, but she's gonna stay around and be our special guest during our chat and chew and uh, get a chance to talk about her book and more of us get a chance to interact with her. So I'm excited to be able to introduce to you the preacher for this morning, the spokeswoman for the King of Glory. Stand to your feet, everybody. And let's welcome Reverend Halima Nath. Hallelujah. Praise be the Lord. Hallelujah. Why don't we start this time of learning by giving God a hand clap, by praising the Lord our Savior for giving us another Sunday to worship him in spirit and in truth, to seek his face in praise and worship. Hallelujah. God, we thank you for this day. Uh, let me think. Do I got a little Compton Virtue off the top? 
Uh, hot like this, gangster for Christ, chick. I'm bright up in your face like you turn on a light switch. I'm balling in Christ with these spiritual gifts. Give God a hand clap if you gain this in your whips. Forget about the past, I'm moving in nowness. Voice of Christ through hip hop, ringing like loudness. I'm loyal to JC like Psalms 26, and I'm combing through the hood like Afro picks. Yeah. That was a throwback. That was my former life. That was my former life. Uh, I am so grateful to be here in this house today. I had the wonderful honor uh, to spend time with people from your congregation at the 9 a.m. service. And I have just been so full with the love that exists in this house. Uh, there are churches all around the country that are trying to accomplish what you all are living out here at the Way Church. So praise God for this incredible ministry, all of the people in the pews, and of course, I gotta give a monster shout out to this great man of God, Pastor Michael McBride. And I would be remiss if I did not give a shout out to his fine wife, Sharice McBride. Listen, Pastor McBride, your wife fine. She fine. Congratulations on 11 years of marriage. Y'all are holding it down. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, listen, I do have one correction. Um, Pastor McBride mentioned that this was a pit stop, but this is an anchor in between one trip and another. Um, this is really an opportunity for me to be reminded of the work that I do with young people in communities. The anchor is the word of God. The anchor is the work that we have to do here in the kingdom. So I'm just hyped to be here at this 11 a.m. service. So thank y'all so much for this invitation. There is a word from the Lord. Open your Bibles or your iPad or your cell phone or your memory if you Pentecostal um, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we will be reading, or from our memory, verses 26 through 31. I will be reading from the New International Version. And the word of God says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the despised things, and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. I want to talk with you all, with your prayers, but more importantly, with God's presence from the subject, if only the strong survive, what happens to the weak? If only the strong survive, what happens to the weak? Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, our Father, thank you for this Sunday. Thank you for this space, for this church, for this opportunity to speak your word. I pray that you just might let me decrease, Father, that you might increase here in this space to speak a clear word to your people. Father, I pray if there is a person in the house that needs your deliverance and there are things blocking their view, that you will remove the scales from their eyes, remove distraction in the house, remove anything that is unlike you, that your word might come forth and we might see your glory. For God's name and for Jesus' name's sake we pray, amen. So this is one of my favorite scripture passages. Paul, who I believe to be the dopest MC next to Pac and K-Dot, um, that is Tupac Shakur and Kendrick Lamar Duckworth, for you all who don't listen. Um, these are California legends in the hip-hop philosophical truth tradition. 
Paul is speaking to me in this passage. A woman who operated most of life along the margins of society with all of the statistics that are often thrown at women, specifically black women, people who come from the hood, trauma connected to living in poverty, and challenges related to imposter syndrome, and trying to thrive in spaces where there aren't a lot of people that look like you. You might find yourself in this passage. If you can relate to looking up and you are in a space that you never thought you can get into, with blessings that you didn't even think to pray for, operating in gifts that only God can bestow. You might see yourself in this passage if you've ever found yourself living out the experience of the least of these. So Paul says, listen, remember where you come from. And when you think of the road, just remember it is because of the hand of God in your life and because of why God chose you. And it ain't the choosing that you're used to. A little bit of context, in this passage, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And the Corinthians had some issues that they were dealing with. You can even say that the Corinthians were in a little bit of a crisis, which I'm sure we all can relate to. Now, in order to understand why Paul chooses these specific words, you have to understand their situation. The Corinthian church was predominantly Gentile, the little people, and a majority of whom were at the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder. They lived in a seaport, a major metropolitan city, and the Christians were struggling with their environment. They were living in a big city, but they were not living a big city life. So Paul turns the spotlight on the social conditions of the individual Corinthians. And it could be concluded that the social differences within the community were at the origin of many of their problems. So I'm wondering, did the Corinthians maybe look at the corrupted non-believers and wonder why their children never went without food? Could it be that some of the Christians at Corinth were awed by the Instagram posts of the social elite and felt pressure to adapt to their lifestyle. People that do anything for clout. Could it be that there was a Christian Corinthian that felt helpless in their situation and became discouraged in their humble conditions? So I gotta tell you, I do not watch the news. I know that I should, but because of my feelings about the devil, I feel like in watching the news at times, I am forced to visually see a manifestation of the enemy working in my community. We live in a country where we see our young people working hard every day in school, but they don't have the finances or the network to get in certain colleges and universities, but other people are buying their way into institutions. <laughs> We live in a country where if you grew up in the 80s and the 90s, you saw a lot of your black and brown friends and family incarcerated for marijuana crimes. But yet the people that are making a lot of money in the cannabis industry don't look like those people that were incarcerated in the 80s and the 90s. We are living in a country where police brutality, where we've become so desensitized to it, that it comes on the news all of the time to the point where it looks like regular scheduled television. We live in a country where being anti-immigrant, specifically anti-black and brown immigrant, can literally win you the White House. You can see something weekly on television that literally attacks your very existence. And the people that are leading the injustice seem to be winning. It feels like a crisis. So it seems to me like the strong are surviving and I feel a little bit weakened. It looks like only the strong can afford quality health care. It looks like only the strong can afford quality education for their children and that only the strong or the wealthy are getting on the ballot because of their friends in high places. 
only the strong are able to escape crimes that would be major if you were a black or brown person, but you are receiving a slap on the wrist because you're not a black and brown person. If only the strong can keep up in this world and specifically in this country that we live in, what does that mean for me? So the Corinthians said, Paul, can you help us? Can you help us with these social conditions? We are trying to live our lives holy. We are trying to live our lives in the right way and we are seeing people that are not doing the same thing living their best lives. Can you preach a sermon, write a letter, do something to help us understand? And Paul stops dead in his tracks and says, think of who you were when you were called. And when you think about it, the condition of some of our communities has put us in a state of weakness. But those conditions actually set you up to be chosen. So there are a few things that we want to remember when we think about this question, if only the strong survive, what happens to the weak? The first is the weak can gain a new narrative for how they've been defined. Someone say new narrative. So part of this Christian walk is being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Why? Because the gospel stands in direct contradiction with humans' ex humans' expectations about God, who God chooses, and how God anoints. But someone told me once that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. The racially discriminated the inner city communities, those living below the poverty line, the women who are often silenced. That simply means that truth and strength actually lies there. I recruit kids from the projects as a part of my work. When I'm thinking about providing opportunities, whether it's scholarships or internship opportunities, public housing and individuals that serve low-income students, that's the first place that I go. And it's because of this scripture passage. This was the passage that got me through college and grad school. This was the scripture passage when I sat in classrooms and I felt like I didn't have the same vocabulary as some of the other people in the classroom. This was the passage that when I got into the corporate space and I was the only woman or the only African American, this was the scripture that I pointed to. This was the scripture that I pointed to when I was praying for my brother on trial and trying to think through what it might look like for us to push through that situation considering what I saw as weakness in our skin color. This was my scripture. Halima, think of who you were and where you were when you were called. Don't you have a selective memory when it comes to this journey? Remember where you were at the beginning. Remember where you were when God saved your soul. Remember where you were when you thought, thought nothing was gonna work out and God ended up giving you more than you asked for. Remember where you were when you prayed for healing in your body and the doctor told you that there was no hope for your situation. Remember where you were, where you were called. I believe that the next generation of talent and innovation is in these underserved populations in these communities that look like us. They are in communities where there are people of color, where they are impoverished, where they are the least of these. Because when we begin to see weakness the way that God sees it, we begin to, as Paul says, rejoice in our weakness. Because that is where God is strong. It gives us a new definition of weak. And we can see the power in the old songs of the church. As I look back over my life and think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I've got a testimony. Now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for me. And in the powerful words of Kung Fu Kenny, if God got us, then we gonna be all right.
I mentioned that Tupac is one of my favorite artists and you know, how he named his life, how he named his challenge was so intricate because he almost began to embrace his demise when he thought about this question. It Ain't Easy is one of my favorite songs by Pac. And he says, it ain't easy being me. Will I see the penitentiary or will I stay free? This ain't the life for me. I want to change, but ain't no future bright for me. I'm stuck in the game. I'm trapped inside a maze. We have to stop embracing a narrative that was given to us but is not ours to keep. I see this in the young people that I serve. They are taking on what they are told they are. With young people, we often blame them for their condition. What I know about trauma within the context of serving black and brown populations is that when a young person is acting out, they are offering suffering through something that they cannot articulate. So if you just embrace this narrative that those are bad kids, those kids are out there. When you get on a train and you see them in one direction, you go in the other. If you embrace that narrative about who our young people are, that's how you will teach them, that's how you will engage them, and that's how you will care for them. But when we begin to see our young people through the eyes of Christ, we are able to see them in their power. Because God chose the weak things to shame the strong. The despised things. In every engagement with a young person, I think a lot about what it means to reclaim students' humanity in spaces where their bodies are already deemed criminal as early as elementary school. And what I learned is the best affirmation that you can give a young person, see high schoolers walking down the street, is I see you. I see you, Javier. I see you, Greg. I see you, Tina. And because we are talking about the ability to see our young people through the narrative of how God speaks about them, then we don't see them as just the weak. Because somebody is being deeply advantaged, dis deeply advantaged by your suffering and the narrative of saving. Because what I learned even in my work is there are certain people that are okay with giving you a donation or donating some coats giving you some shoes, because they feel like they're saving you. But when you ask them to sit at the table to engage you as a peer, when you ask them to open up the doors of their C-suites and bring you into the executive office, that's uncomfortable for them. Because then they're no longer saving you, you are a peer. There is a difference between position and power. And there are too many of us that are fighting for position and not for our power. Because if you are in a place where you have a godly position, that's where you can release your power. Don't fight for the title and the position because often that's where you'll be used and not used in the right way. So what does it mean to be perceived weak? It means to be a candidate to be chosen by God. And that leads me to the next point. The weak are chosen. The Bible says God chose the weak things. Despite the fact that they are not a part of the social elite, the Corinthians were chosen by God. The Bible teaches us that those who were chosen to represent God were not worthy according to the world's standards. Think about it. In our spaces when we think about leadership, right? You know, like people have a picture of what that looks like. People have this portrait most of the time it looks like white men, right? You know, there's not a lot of executives that look at the cover of NWA and say, that is our new C-suite. But a person like Dr. Dre could see talent in a different way because most of those people on that NWA color, cover are transforming their industries individually. And so we see that in the Bible. Moses, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Jeremiah, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. And David, a sheep herder, where God said, do not consider his appearance. I am looking at his heart. 
You paying too much attention to his dreadlocks that you're not seeing his talent. You paying too much uh, to her attire where you're not seeing her gift. So some of you have believed that you cannot be chosen because of your past, because of your criminal record, because of your sexual orientation, because of how you talk. Your words don't flow the way some other people's do. So what I want you to understand is this is not about what you see in the mirror, but it's about what God sees in your spirit. Some of us are working so hard to conform in spaces where God has placed us there to transform. If God places you at the table and you close your mouth, you are literally not living out why God placed you there. Some of us are just content with a seat at the table as opposed to actually operating in God's power and in your calling while you are at the table. So if you are silent in matters of injustice, if you are silent when you see things happen in your neighborhood, if you are silent in conversations where you see things that are opposed to what you hear in the word of God, you, that seat there is purposeless. Mystique is my favorite X-Men character. So I used to read comic books when I was little, way back in the day, back, back in the day. So Mystique can actually change into any character. She could be a direct replica of whoever she sees. But what you don't see in the movie that you read in the comic books is that this gift is also a curse because it takes away some of her physical power every time she becomes someone else. Every time that you put on someone else, it takes away some of your power. Every time you decide that you wanna forget that you're a person of color in conversations, every time where it's easier to act like you're not a Christian because it's not cool or new age or woke in certain spaces, then you are losing some of your power. So there might be something appealing like mimicking what you see but you are losing the deepest part of what that gift can give you. So when you are a room, when you are in a room and you are engaging your peers, there is something that is uniquely powerful about you. There is no one else that can be you. And you shouldn't be walking around trying to be anyone else. Because there is more of an effort to pawn and parade you instead of engaging you to change the condition of your community. It's easy to just have a bunch of replicas of black people or brown people. It's easier to just pick people that can play the role. It's harder to actually engage in transformational conversation. So will you be the person who stands for transform transformative justice or will you be a pawn for white supremacist projects? Just a question. So back to the original question. If only the strong survive what happens to the weak, those considered weak can gain a new narrative. Those considered weak are chosen. And finally, it is in perceived weakness where God can get the greatest glory. This same God who chose the weak to showcase his strength is the same God that turns caterpillars into butterflies, coals into diamonds. Why? For his glory. So when people saw you squirming in the dirt, you couldn't even help yourself. You can imagine the things that people said about you, but a butterfly is not born a butterfly, but it is born a worm, worm that has to live in the rut before it gets wings to fly. It has to be a whole new texture. It has to be remade. It has to be redeveloped. And then when it comes forth to be what it is destined to be, you can look at it and say, that is a beautiful butterfly. That is a beautiful beautiful work of God. I am embracing a new narrative. And just because I am considered weak, I can gain a new godly redefinition. And because I am considered weak, I'm chosen. So I'm doing more than survive. I am succeeding because of my savior. And that is the desire that I have for my people. 
that we strive to do more than just survive. The strong and who perceives them to be strong, let them keep surviving. I'm tired of seeing us scratch and survive. I'm ready to thrive in the kingdom of God. So the weak who are chosen by God to do more than merely survive, they succeed in Christ. And we see this in the stories of our people even here in this sanctuary. We just watch these sisters here on this stage talk about the power of story, the power of testimony. They are overcoming by the blood of the lamb, but by the word of their testimony, by written word. You could see that in the people that shared their testimony of being addicted for years and now celebrating anniversaries of sobriety. You can see that in the testimony of people that thought that literally the best thing that you do is gang bang and sell weight in the hood because that's what you thought you were good at. And then they're up in pulpits actually preaching the word of God. We see it in our kingdom every day. These are testimonies of coals that become diamonds and worms that become butterflies because that is how God works. Because you know what? If we could rely on our own strength for our blessings, we wouldn't give God credit. Mm -mm. We would stand and just talk about our resumes and all the great things that we've done on our own. We give that same story about how we pulled ourselves up from the bootstraps and made things happen, but there is no power in that. Because when there is testimony and you can give glory to God, there is somebody else who will become a butterfly. There is another person who will become a diamond. There is a community of individuals that will thrive in Christ. And that is the glory that we want to give our Savior. Thank you, God, for making me a butterfly. Thank you, God, for seeing past my faults and seeing my needs and making me a woman of God that can stand in a pulpit when my teachers counted me out, when my social worker counted me out, when my friends counted me out. My God in heaven reached down and said, Halima is my chosen vessel. And that is something, my brothers and sisters, that only God can do. And so I can stand here and give glory because none of this I can take credit for. Please, I am a blooper. But because of God in my life, I stand here living my wildest dreams and having the kind of career where I can help young people do the same. That is the gift of the kingdom and the gift of saying, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I got the bag because of what the Lord has done for us. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet, everyone.